Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Christmas Tree Network webinar on current disease issues. I'd like to introduce you all to Janet Allen, horticultural consultant, and Erica Wedgwood, research scientist from ADAS, who will be taking the lead on today's webinar. But before I hand over, I'd just like to cover a few housekeeping rules. You are automatically muted on entering the webinar. We do kindly ask that you remain on mute while the speakers are speaking, but we would like this to be an interactive session, so please do feel free to ask questions using the chat box or unmuting yourself. There will be um, time for questions at the end also. And this session is being recorded and will be uploaded onto the Tevi Cymru Knowledge Hub via other Tevi Cymru channels. And if anyone has any concerns about this, please do email me. Um, as numbers are small today, shall we do just really short um, introductions, just your name and where, where you're from? Um, thank you all and welcome. Thank so, David. Okay, so David Phillips, um, Clearwell Farm near Cardiff in South Wales. We do Christmas trees, which we've been playing with for 10 years, I suppose. Um, we sell about a thousand a year at the moment and trying to build that up. And we also do pumpkins now and a maize maize in the, in the summer with some sunflowers in it. That's us. Thank you, David. And um, Michael? Or you're on mute. Right. Putin's homegrown from Anglesey. We have farm shops, produce soft fruit, vegetables, um, farm kitchen. Uh, Christmas trees, we planted 1500 this time, um, probably 15 years ago since we planted any before and uh, we sold some and the rest are now uh, pit props. Um, but uh, the ones we planted this spring, we need some advice from Janet on weed control. And you and should have a couple of images to uh, send her, to her to uh, show her what they look like at the moment. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Yep. Yeah. I think um, you and I'll share them a little later in the presentation. So over to you, Janet and Erica. Hi. Okay, waiting for. <laughs> right, hi. Um, oh dear, right. Okay, can we go to the next one, please? Erica, can you go yeah, on to the next, on the next one? Yeah. All right. Okay, lovely. Right. Okay. Basically, we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about just really things that you ought to be looking out for and dealing with now. Uh, also looking a little bit at uh, the future, particularly with regards to cleaning up sites pre-planting, you know, deciding whether the site is suitable for Christmas trees, and also about nutritional requirements. And then Erica, whose expertise is plant pathology, is going to talk about um, the three major diseases currently affecting, in particular, Nordman fir. And I think we're going to be specifically Nordman fir, although one of these also goes on spruces, rhizosphera, current season needle necrosis, and fireweed rust. Okay, next slide, please. Right, these are the pest side. Um, basically, these are the things that I am actually seeing at the moment or expect to see very shortly and that you may need to be looking at, uh, looking for on your crops at this, this time. So the first one is silver fir woolly aphid, the Adelsh Nordmani Arna. That has been active down here in the southeast now for a couple of weeks as the trees have come into flush. And currently there are a lot of crawlers out onto the young growth and beginning to feed and cause needle distortion. Uh, similarly, balsam woolly aphid, which tends to confine itself more to uh, Fraser fir and noble fir, but you can occasionally find on Nordman, that is also now active and uh, crawlers have moved on to young growth and are causing damage. But they are, in both cases with these Adelgias, now very vulnerable to pesticide sprays. Uh, giant fir aphid, Cynara confinis, I haven't seen it yet myself, uh, and this is the same as had happened in uh, over several years now. It tends to be active towards the end of this month or early July, but you should start looking particularly under the branches and on the main stems, lower main stems of trees, to see if there are adults uh, or juveniles present. 
conifer spinning mite, while our Nordman fir, not generally a problem, but after in this part of the world, after two serially hot uh, summers in June and July, conifer spinning mite has started to appear on Nordman fir and most particularly on younger trees that have come, I suspect, from nurseries already infested with the pest. And it can cause, if you do not uh, deal with it at an early enough stage, some needle damage and possibly premature needle drop. Uh, rust mite, Nalapella species, well, they've been active down here in the south, more or less all of the winter because it was so mild. Um, when I say active, uh, I was finding adults and juveniles actually on needles and in warm weather causing some feeding damage. Um, really, now numbers are coming up incredibly rapidly. But it, we've, we've here been having, we've had now three days where in some places the temperatures have hit 30 degrees and the relative humidity is very high. So uh, most growers are currently putting in sulfur automatically with their insecticide rounds for the pests I've just mentioned, uh, or in some cases, if they have material still available, uh, using a specific acaricide for control. And last of all, Tortrix moth caterpillars. This is primarily light brown apple moth, which has uh, caused damage particularly to Nordman, but also Fraser fir. Uh, needles in uh, recent years, two generations a year. The adults of the first generation are now just in this part of the world starting into their uh, flight and so sprays for preventing damage where it's occurred in the past will be necessary fairly soon. Okay, next slide please. Right, just a couple, a few pictures, the mites. The, uh, on the mite side, on the top right hand side, that, those are Nalapella rust mites, very small, you need a times 20 hand lens to see them, and you need you know, to be very uh, concentrated to actually identify that they're present and they're alive. They will move, actually, not rapidly, but they, they pull themselves along by their mouth parts, but you can see them. Uh, the pictures below are basically damage caused by conifer spinning mite and note the sort of rusty appearance at the bases of the, the needles, that's typical of conifer spinning mite. With rust mite, you get a, which is the picture on the right-hand side at the bottom for mites, that is uh, more of a general um, graying and browning of needles, which sometimes can be confused with diseases. On the aphids, that's Cynara confinis, which is probably the largest aphid in terms of size you will ever come across in the UK. Um, quite frightening when you first see it, but you know, that's normally where it is on the main stem, um, can go right up to the leader to feed directly into the sap flow of the tree. Next, um, next pictures, please. Right, adelgias, uh, typical uh, female overwintering adelgias on the uh, top uh, left-hand corner. Note the, the woolly wax uh, protecting them, which makes them uh, pretty difficult to kill with insecticides. Then below that, you can see the crawlers. Um, then uh, below that, on, um, sorry, on the bottom uh, right-hand side, that's the damage caused by um, balsam fir, silver uh, aphid. And then the top is again, typical damage caused by those little crawlers to current season extension growth. And then the caterpillars, you've got a picture of pictures of uh, light brown apple moth uh, adults um, and also um, feeding damage. Okay, next one. Right, can I say to people actually, because we are short of time today, that any queries that you have, re-pest uh, control, pest and weed and disease uh, weed control, if you would be kind enough to actually raise it at the end of the meeting and put it in this question, if we don't have time, then I will deal with it and email it out to you, you know, what I consider you should, should be looking at or doing. I hope that's okay, but I am very aware I want to give my colleague as much time as possible because she's got the more important part of today's presentation. Anyway, the things to think about for the future at this stage, and you probably all think this is terribly early, but it is very necessary. If you, you should be thinking now about what sites you're going to plant this late autumn, 21, or late winter, early spring of 2022, because this is a really good time to see what weeds are actually present on your site. Now, if you've got cereals or something like that, have a peer down inside, you know, the, the crop canopy and see what annual weeds are there. You may also see, you know, things like a small amount of 
perennial bindweed or cooch grass or other perennial grasses, a horsetail, those sort of things. It's worthwhile doing a little bit of walking around if you don't know the field very well already, be its weed spectrum, to see what is likely to be there as an annual weed in the spring after you plant and also what is likely to be a problem, re a perennial weed. If you don't do it now, you could get an extremely unpleasant surprise uh, come next spring soak summer once the trees are in position uh, and find yourself in a situation where some things just are totally uncontrollable. Um, this is why I say will all weeds be controllable? Some are definitely not. Uh, forget ever trying to 100% control horsetail, it's impossible. The same is true of perennial bindweeds and almost of rose bay willow herb. But if you haven't got too much of it in the field, if you are persistent, you can certainly give it a big headache and delay it being a problem or reduce it to the extent that you can control it sufficiently not to get disease problems as a result of its presence. One of the other things to consider is that the crop that you've got in the field at the moment, will it be out of the way early enough to apply suitable controls in terms of herbicides? You know, if you've got, for instance, silage maize on site at the moment, you're not going to be cutting that till very late in the, in the year, later in the late summer or, or more likely autumn. And by then, a lot of the weed targets which are present at the moment will no longer be there or the weeds will be in such a condition that they won't take up herbicides. And you may have to rethink if there's a big weed problem as to whether you plant or not. So let's go look at quickly at new uh, plantations that have been put in this year and fairly young established plantations. Good time to look through and see what weeds are present and to assess, do they actually need any control? Now, you know, I fully appreciate that A, it takes time to apply herbicides, and B, they are quite costly. So it is worthwhile just doing a little bit thinking about this in terms of are the weeds present going to have any impact on tree growth? For instance, if you've now got a field of groundsel, you know, which is an annual, and it's already flowering and the trees are growing away quite happily, well, I don't think it's necessary to put on a Dow shield overall to actually kill that weed because it's on its way out anyway. More importantly, it would be a good idea to put on a follow-up residual herbicide to stop more groundsel from germinating later in the, in the year. And even then, it might not be necessary if you've got plenty of uh, soil moisture reserves because you haven't got a particularly weed, uh, serious weed species present. However, if in contrast, you've got a huge amount of grass weeds, particularly things like black grass growing, which can be quite competitive, uh, or even some perennial grasses, then yes, it is worthwhile now considering applying uh, a contact translocated material in order to reduce the amount so the tree can carry on growing quite happily and establishing uh, for the rest of the growing season. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, you know, would it be better to go after the weeds now or will you be able to eliminate them completely, you know, or very effectively with an autumn, early winter glyphosate or hurricane use? Okay. Next slide, please. Right. Last of all, a quick, quickly about nutrition, uh, back to selecting a site to plant. Right, very important this, must be free draining. And now Christmas trees will tolerate a lot, and particularly uh, Nor um, Nor um, Norway spruce. But Nordman fir is, does not like, uh, or, or um, does noble fir or Fraser fir, uh, land which is waterlogged for part of the year. Now, sometimes the waterlogging may be a, an extreme situation you know, that occurs once every 40 or 50 years. But if there is the risk, particularly of waterlogging um, in the late spring, early summer around flushing or in the early autumn, then you really must look at the situation and assess it as to whether it will be a safe place to plant because Fortunately, Nordman fir doesn't normally get Phytophthora cinnamoni um, as a root rot, but Fraser fir and Noble fir definitely can. And you could soon be looking at, if you've got waterlogging in the autumn months or in the spring, vast numbers of trees lost to that disease. And also just the fact that they are waterlogged will reduce the root run and cause the trees to grow more slowly and not achieve their full potential. Make sure you have a good depth of topsoil if you can, 
that's not necessarily possible on some sites, but on some sites there's actually quite good uh, subsoil as well. Um, you need good soil structure to permit root penetration to depth and also for planting. If you've got compaction there, planting a Nordman fir with an enormous tap root, uh, which is at least the same length as the top growth when your um, um, uh, line, uh, plants come to be lined out or planted out, is more or less impossible and you land up with a tree which is either its root system half out of the ground, so it's already sort of penalized and that it can't take up moisture and nutrients very effectively and it's vulnerable to dehydration, or, or it is lopsided or at an angle, which means it will never grow straight. As far as soil types are concerned, a sandy or sandy loam is absolutely ideal, but lots of growers plant Christmas trees and successfully grow them on sandy clay loams. But if you can, if possible, avoid clay or silt-based soils. They're, they tend, in the case of the clay ones, to be like concrete in the summer. Uh, although they have the moisture reserves there, you get a lot of cracking and often very bad uh, root to soil uh, connections. Um, and then in the winter, they are impossible to actually work on and cut and remove trees from plantations or do any sort of work. They preferably, they don't want to be prone to drought. Well, I know in Wales, rainfall is not generally a problem uh, in your part of the world, but it certainly is here. And after the last couple of summers, drought, even in your part of the world, could be a possibility. Um, obviously, the water logging and also avoid sites where soil erosion is uh, likely to take place. So if you're on a very light sandy soil in the slope, think before you plant as to how you're going to reduce the amount of um, soil erosion. It may be that you have the field planted with grass, established some grass for a couple of years, and then burn that off with some a low rate life state at the last moment and plant directly into that. Um, that is one possibility and I've known people do that and that's helped no end or make sure there's grass strips at uh, various intervals where the uh, speed of the water coming down the field will be reduced. Um, you, if you can plant soils which have some organic matter in them, that's always better and have the right pH. Now, there's a bit of a misnomer here. People think that Christmas trees love very acid soils. Well, some tree species, uh, notably the spruces, will tolerate very low pHs, even down to about 4.5 as will Fraser fir, but the majority of them actually prefer it slightly on the alkaline side in order to make sure that all nutrients are freely available. So really for things like um, Nordman fir, six to 6.5 is perfectly suitable. Um, what you do want to try and avoid though are sites that are over um, six, eight, uh, and where you've uh, the, the site, the topsoil is overlying a very calcareous base, which is something like chalk or, or limestone. But even then, I do know growers can get away with it, certainly with spruces and perhaps um, uh, things like well, blue, uh, blue spruce and Norway spruce, but it becomes less suitable for things like um, uh, northern fir and uh, noble fir. Um, you could if you had a very high pH, consider applying uh, sulfur, reduce the pH, but quite honestly, life is too short and it's generally not too, uh, not worthwhile in the UK for a Christmas tree crop because it's going to be on such a large scale. And if you've got underlying chalk or limestone, you sooner or later the roots will get down into it and all your reduction of pH on the uh, topsoil will uh, come to naught. Um, you can use acidifying fertilizers where um, sort of fairly basic soils have actually been uh, lined up for things like potatoes over a number of years. If you use sulfate of potash and ammonium sulfate as sources of fertilizer and keep the soil surface bare, then there will be um, quite a lot of leaching of lime from the topsoil and the pH on some sites can drop actually quite quickly that, that way. Um, keep the so soil, as I said, weed free, and that will also help to reduce move lime down and say fortunately Nordman fir is a bit more tolerant than other species so 6 to 6.5 will be okay for it so generally um, there is no need to lime on what I would call normal agricultural soils but you might find yourself in a situation where you have a naturally acid soil of having to before planting even plow down lime in order to bring the pH up to make it more suitable and then have to apply another amount of lime perhaps in year three or year four to maintain the pH. Okay, I think that's it. I don't know, for me. Next slide. Oh no, got a bit more, right, right. 
do, are you all right, Erica, or can I do the last, last one? You might as well carry on. <laughs> okay, right, very quickly. Right, other things to check before planting, some of which I've already mentioned. Um, good idea to check major nutrient levels are adequate. Now, I know it's not much fun taking soil samples at this time of the year, but actually, if you've got uh, an open field, you know, um, it's worthwhile doing now. So you then you can think ahead and act accordingly before you plant. Um, take soil samples if it's a brand new site from 0 to 15 and then 15 to 30 centimetres. It is worth doing that because then you get an idea, do I have to plough down some nutrients because your Christmas trees are a long term crop, you know, they're going to be there for seven, eight, maybe 10 years before they're eventually cleared. Check the pH, I've already mentioned, check uh, phosphorus, uh, potassium and magnesium. I, I must stress that potassium and magnesium are very, very important for the Christmas trees because they dictate, along with nitrogen, the colour of the needles and quite often needle colour loss, i.e. trees turning yellow, towards Christmas is due to either a shortage of potassium or magnesium or an excess of um, potassium available to the trees which they have taken up and in turn have meant that they can't take up adequate magnesium and that can happen quite rapidly so do keep an eye on it. Uh, in my experience unless you're on land which is being reclaimed from up from some other purpose or is heathland or old forestry site micronutrients are levels are really not very often important with Christmas trees, with the exception of manganese and iron. But generally, those are only problems where the soil is very alkaline. And although you can, to a certain extent, redress uh, the manganese situation by applying manganese sulfate or chelated, uh, chelated um, manganese, uh, products, it's it's never brilliant, and iron is practically impossible, uh, an iron deficiency to, to redress in Christmas trees. Aim to bring the soil to indexes, this is for phosphorus, three to four, two to three for potassium, and two for magnesium. It's important to get that potassium to magnesium ratio right and maintain it there. So once you've planted, I would urge you at least once every three years to take some more soil samples and possibly the same year as you do the soil sampling, do some sampling of the needles of the trees in January, February time uh, of mature needles to see whether your trees are in balance or not and they are taking up what is available or what do I need to, to, to change, okay? Uh, what is it about drainage? Uh, prepare the site well beforehand, subsoiling, etc. Uh, when trees are that set about straight. I think that's it actually, I think we're there. Oh yes, make, just make sure when you are planting that you can, the soil is such that you can get the soil, the trees in really well, and then push some uh, soil around them so that they uh, do not become dehydrated, the roots. And that's quite important obviously this year with the temperature ratcheting up and high wind speeds at time as well. Okay, that's it from me. Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, now then, um, Janet's told you how to um, plant your trees, but now I'm going to perhaps dispirit you by all the things that can go wrong once you've actually planted them in. Um, so your trees can become unmarketable. You may find that you have needles affected across the tree, only maybe one or, one or two or three, whatever it is, and that will still cause a problem where you can get the whole lengths of the branch affected. Sometimes you, uh, the needles are retained, so they show the disease but sometimes they can drop, which is probably just as bad because you end up with bare stems. Um, you may get infected in the current seasons, season measles, or you may think you've got away with it, but then the symptoms take a year or more to show and you get symptoms delayed. Unfortunately, as you know, with conifers, they can't replace their, their leaves. So once the damage is done, it can't be undone. So as Janet said, I'm going to pick on three diseases of importance and uh, go over some of their symptoms and what you can try and do to stop them losing you um, marketable produce. So first is the rise of the needle cast. That has been a big problem in the USA on Colorado blue spruce, uh, less so on certain pines and firs. You can see a picture there on the right of what it looks like on the uh, Colorado blue spruce with the uh, slightly purpling of the needles and the, the loss of needles along the stems there. 
However, in 2017, uh, we started to get a major problem in some UK and Irish northern and fir plantations. Uh, it was really the wetter western parts of the UK spreading over to into the East Midlands. Unfortunately, now we have it all over the UK. So on the right there is a picture of it on Nordman, and you can see that yellowing discoloration of the, the needles that was seen in February in, in Scandinavia from the previous uh, infection in the previous year. So as I said earlier, you get the needles missing initially on the innermost and lower branches, so where it's humid. And the, although those needles are infected to start with, you can get the infection then spreading up the tree uh, perhaps into September. And in fact, in the States, they have uh, noted that there is uh, perhaps a peak of in infection symptoms showing uh, at a particular in the, later in the year as well as earlier in the year. So initially you get the goldening color and then you get the purplish brown. Um, so you get the needles then dropping um, or staying on the tree for a bit longer, but you'll notice a lot of needles uh, that will drop. However, unfortunately, Norbans can also drop them when they are green. And you can, it's possible that when you come to harvest trees, you give them a, a shake and the needles will be dropping off. So here's a, a close up of, of some of the symptoms. So you can see on the bottom left there, some needles that have become uh, spiral shaped and these were okay last year, but now May this year, they're starting to show this, this typical symptom. On the right, you can see sort of needles here and there that have become infected. Possibly either the spores didn't land on the ones that aren't infected or the, the moisture wasn't sufficient for the infection to take. So you will get the needles eight months to 15 months, maybe even up to two years after infection, you'll get these brown symptoms gradually developing, uh, particularly into the, into the second summer, you'll see the browning. And you'll see it all, all over the tree, as I said earlier, tending to start at the bottom, but then coming upwards and outwards. So the emerging needles are infected in the spring, uh, although they can, be infected uh, probably into sort of late August. Uh, it has to be conditions that are wet and around about 20 to 25 degrees centigrade. That is for the release of the spores and also so that the spores have moisture to be able to germinate and get into the, um, the breeding pores, the stomata on the leaves on the underside. So I said, you, you can get some symptoms in the first year, but it's mainly into the second year gradual development of the discoloration and then the needles will fall off. And you can see a sad looking tree on the right there, uh, 15 months after infection, uh, that's September there. And uh, there's a whole cluster of needles, gray needles, gray brown needles on the ground. And it's those needles that are easily, really the cause of the uh, lower tree infection because there will be rain splash upwards and it's the uh, lower branches that become infected first. So to actually try and work out whether you have got rhizosphera, you need to have a look on the leaf undersides with a hand lens or you can in a larger photo, take a photo and, and do it that way. So look for some of the older uh, needles. You can perhaps rummage around under the tree um, because it takes a while for these structures to develop. You can see on the right there, there's these tiny sort of pinhead um, structures that are coming out called pycnidia, and they form out of those breathing pores, the stomata. So they can be in quite sort of straight lines. You can have like four or five lines each side of the, the midrib. And it's those, those that need to swell in the rain to be able to produce a sort of a slime that comes out. It's not windborne, it's actually sort of splashed. It won't, won't blow in the wind unless it's a strong wind. But if you really know to know what it is and you're not sure, uh, obviously I send it to a plant clinic. Uh, just a reminder, you can get these uh, infections developing, uh, these, these symptoms showing these black pycnidia. If the trees are, are stressed, the symptoms seem to develop much more quickly. So you get the cycle coming through uh, more quickly. So what you can you do about it? Unfortunately, we've not long lost the chlorophenol and copper fungicides. Uh, that were applied at intervals post flushing. Uh, we have got diethane still, although the rest of Europe hasn't. Um, 
but it might be a job to get hold of hold, hold of it. Uh, there is an e EMU for uh, amistaris oxystrobin and it lists needle casts and lights on the label. But you probably realise that it's hard to get good coverage on the trees, uh, particularly when those needles are tight in the flush. So it's a, it's a job to actually get the protection on the trees. You'd of course normally perhaps uh, look at a, a rainfall forecast and, and realise that there might be going to be a, a, a flush of spore release from the old leaves and then put a spray on. But then if the rain doesn't come and the spores don't release, you've, you've wasted the spray. So that was always a problem. What we need to work towards really is uh, infield met recording so that we know when the rains happen because sometimes we get storms that are quite localized and some spore detection systems you can have spore um, spore track machines that you can either uh, you can use um, molecular techniques to diagnose things with on the right there's a, a picture of this pycnidia and the spores that are coming out of it is, it does have to ooze out, not, um, doesn't blow out, it needs to swell and then ooze a, as a mice, a sort of mucus that comes out. So what can you do for um, cultural control? Uh, clearly, if you can avoid it, don't plant the established conifers. And if you're buying propagation materials, if you can go and have a look and see um, what's what's happening at your propagator and check that they aren't near established conifers because there's a high chance that uh, those will be infected. Uh, check your stock before you plant it because once it's in the field it's, it's likely to spread and, and check again the next year because it may well have come in on something and not be visible and you only get the expression in the, in the second year. It might be a good idea to prune out infected branches because the spores will splash onto the uh, from one needle to the next and uh, sort of from the ground upwards. But be careful when you do that because it's sort of a sticky sort of spore. Uh, it can spread to uh, the new new infection new tissue. So use some alcohol to sterilize, uh, ideally between cuts, but as often as possible. Try to remove the infected branches from the field. However, you know, needles will have fallen on the ground. And so unless you're going to be out with a dustpan and brush or something rather, um, it, it's going to be a job. But, you know, as much as you can take away, because otherwise it is just going to splash up onto the, the new material. Um, the other thing to mention is that because it needs 48 hours of water on the leaves, the better you can uh, get air circulation through your crop. A good one on the right here. Nice spacing. The weeds have been controlled. Um, if you have a bigger trees, you can um, reduce shearing so that they're less dense. Uh, it's possible, maybe if you want to be certain, you could actually not plant it every, you know, as, as increase the spacing. Because there's no point having well uh, tightly plant, planted trees and then finding that they've got the infection. Uh, and as I said, remove as much as you can of rubbish from around the trees. Okay, so that's the rhizosphera. On to current season needle necrosis. And the clue with that one is in the is in the name. So whereas the rhizosphera was infected in the current season, it didn't show until the necrosis didn't show until the second year. This is uh, showing in the current year, uh, current year, the year of infection. So it has been a serious foliage disorder of Northerns in Europe and North America for at least twenty five years. Um, it's caused by a fungus called Sidoia polyspora. Initially in those 25 years, they weren't too sure whether it was a fungus um, and they thought it might be physiological. Um, but since then, the isolations have been uh, found, done and, and found it is this fungus. Uh, in this country, it's uh, south, south and south, well, Wales as well, and in the East England and the Midlands. And affected trees will be scattered across the plantations. On the right here is a sorry looking tree. It's lost its bits of foliage and, and it's surrounded by its neighbours, which are, you know, oblivious to it. So it, it's very strange. If you go into pl some plantations, you can have up to 40% of the trees severely affected, perhaps uh, not uncommonly uh, 10%. So they said necrosis and needle drop edge of tree, little trees, big trees that uh, can come in uh, all over the place in the plantation. It does tend to be sort of in the middle of the tree, whereas the rhizosphere was around the bottom. It can be more sort of on the more exposed 
uh, areas. Um, and you will still see some needles, although it's current season needles, some will hang on in there, so you will see them into their second year, but you'll mainly see the expression in the, in the first year and the needles will then drop. So you can get needles here and there affected, or you can get whole lengths of, of the current season's needles that uh, become affected and drop off. The symptoms will show from May, so pretty much as soon as the disease gets there, it can show, or it can delay until December. So you think you've got away with it, start marking up the trees for harvest, and then it can hit you. So this is the symptoms, some really distinctive symptoms. So if you look on the right there, you've got these uh, necrotic, these brown needle tips, and then there's that distinct dark brown band, sort of a lateral band before you get to the green tissue again. It seems to, if you look under the microscope, it seems to sort of cut it off almost. It's maybe some sort of response by the plant that's trying to stop the disease working its way back. Um, bottom there, you can see it's, it's, these have kind of dried off where they've um, been killed, obviously. And then there's that blockage there between the green tissue. And the unfortunate consequence is these, these bare stems. There's a few little ones hanging on in there um, with some little blotches, but by, by the end of autumn, you can probably expect to have um, some bare lengths of branch in your, where your current season needles were. So if you want to sort of have a check and see what's going on, um, if you can see the picture on the right there, you have again on the necrotic tissue, got these spore bodies, but with current season needle necrosis, they are sort of agglomerations of bodies. They're not the little pinhead things. Uh, they tend to be a bit more random, although they're in the stomata, they seem to be here and there more. Um, they will again be quite small. And what happens is when these get moist, is that bottom picture, you get the ooze out from them, which will spread. So that's spl splash or contact. But because they're on the undersides, they have got to have you know, quite a severe um, rainstorm to actually get that splash. Or if you're perhaps going through with equipment, it will actually um, spread that way. Possibility that there's airborne spores, but we've let yet to sort of confirm that because it is a fungus that has two um, stages to its life cycle. Uh, several um, fungi have this thing where you have the asexual stage, which is this one, and then you get the airborne uh, phase, which is the sexual stage. Um, so it has it's been identified, but not actually on the uh, not commonly known from the plantations. But again, not sure. Send off to a plant clinic. So just looking at uh, the infection, so the infection is on the new needle flushes. Perhaps it's because the needles are softer and, and more susceptible. Um, and then maybe because the water is held in those tight needles, so sort of the brush at the end. In Denmark, it has been linked to the same time as when you have Puccinia uh, outbreaks. So that's wet weather. Similarly in Oregon, misty cool weather happens there. And that's uh, very commonly uh, the common uh, to find common se current season needle necrosis. However, do be aware that it can be latent, so it just seems to come in on new plantings apparently from nowhere, and we are fearful that it is coming in on seed lots. Uh, the Danes have just tested a couple of lots, and one was 1% of the seed infected, and another a massive 30% had the pathogen present. And also, it has been isolated from symptomless trees, so you have got a problem if you're buying stock. Um, it may actually hold it and it's possible that the symptoms are then sort of expressed in, in triggered by the conditions in your field. So it's often seen by warm, wet weather and particularly in conditions of high light intensity. In the USA, it has been linked particularly, they've written in the literature about late May, early June after high temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, and Janet has, has told me about situations where she knows there's been a thunderstorm in, in, in May. And then this sort of sudden hot periods that we seem to get nowadays, really, you know, you can feel it on your back. And then within three days, you can get this, these chlorotic bands developing. So it's possible the stress makes the symptoms express a lot quicker. Um, also, if you get butt and skirt pruning, that may stress the trees. And it either makes the latent infection show, or it's possible that it can be increasing, increasing the susceptibility to infection. There's a lot we don't really know still about this disease. So chlorophyll and, nil and copper fungicides aren't now permitted. Amistar is, uh, has an EMU for needle blights and casts. 
So there are efficacy trials underway, um, but the problem is with those is trying to get enough trees with infection to compare the results. So as I said, it's scattered throughout plantations. You can imagine sort of laying out a trial, but you don't know whether you're going to get the infected trees in that area. So really we need some lab tests to see if the fungicides do work on this uh, fungus in petri dishes and then go on to perhaps try some inoculated trials. The ideal as, as for the rhizosphera would be to have a better idea of when the spores are actually arriving and then link to the weather forecasting uh, so you know when the rain is there so that we can actually be more precise in timing the fungicide uh, treatments rather than missing missing it because you've got to protect the tissue um, and stop it getting in there in the first place. So cultural control really is your perhaps one of your main things to do. So obviously don't plant new stock with symptoms. Um, if you can remove the weeds around the, around the bottom, prune the canopies, increase air circulation so that the spores have less chance to survive when they land on the leaves the needles and um, they can shrivel up before they enter the stomata. It's possible that um, we can get some susceptible, uh, less susceptible varieties. Growers have reported differences between varieties, but you don't know whether that's to do with just the timing of flush uh, of those particular um, trees. So there are trials now underway to try and work it out, um, putting varieties in the same field and recording flushing and that sort of thing. So there, there is perhaps hope for that field uh, of, of control. Okay, then moving on to my last disease, rust, Puxiniastra mepiloba, a mouthful there. Um, there are other rusts, but this is the main one that you need to be worried about at the moment. Um, it's been uh, uh, found on ABs albi, alba for quite some time, um, and, but it wasn't really causing much damage. So if you sort of read the literature from a few years ago, no, no worries uh, by this, but now we're having uh, the Norbans being grown more widely in plantations of Christmas trees, we're starting to see more of this rust. The fungus uh, completes its life cycle on the uh, tall flower spiked rose bay willow herbs. That's the ones with a sort of a pyramidal flower, not the, the little bits of flowers here and there. Uh, it can be known as fireweed as well. It's now named Camerian angustifolium, but you may, may uh, know it in, in older books as Epilobium. Um, fuchsia is another alternate host, but that's probably no, not concern of you unless you're growing um, ornamentals as well. And the, the problem with the fireweed is this um, produces spores that are windblown and they can blow quite some distance. It's a bit like the cereal, cereal rusts. They will blow, you know, across into the next, next fields. So a real problem with this uh, spreading. So these are the symptoms. ABs. On the right there, you can see that's the upper surface, so the damage is visible, uh, and also below. So you start to see this in spring, early, sem uh, early summer, so you get yellow banding, and then eventually you'll get the yellow spore bodies, sort of yellow and, and white bits, really, so it looks, it looks like yellow, and they really stick out of the stomata, so they're not sort of squat, they are hanging out a bit there. And then in summer, the needles will shrivel and fall. And then you end up with um, bad bro uh, bare branches. So the life cycle is, is pretty complex, really, but you, you just need to worry about one, one bit of it. So the main thing to, is that the spores are on the fireweed uh, and they've been overwintering um, in telia. And then these are produced then when the um, telia swell in May with water, they will reduce. Uh, release these uh, basidia, which then go on to the needles, particularly at the uh, paintbrush stage, because they, they think probably because the water is held there. So before the bud scales have dropped and the needles start to spread. So it's possible that later flushing trees may escape attack. So the, the basidia from these fireweed uh, overwintering spores do need water, so they can't germinate without that. Um, and then they, they get into the stomata and they perform as they sort of feed on the needle. And it's very quick, so they're, they're really quite, quite aggressive. And then on those needles, you get more spores, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, produced called Aesia. And those needles only infect fireweed. So that's important. That's a sort of a, a, a highlight there. It doesn't go back onto the 
a fur, it just infects fireweed and the fireweed um, infects itself again and again. So you get more and more of these spores on the fireweed. Um, it forms uridia, they're bright orange on the underside of the, the leaves, you can see them quite clearly. And then as the uh, season progresses they, and the nutrients deplete in the fireweed, um, telia, which are kind of squat black, sort of shiny bodies will form over winter. And then again in the spring in May, you'll get those uh, bursting out and producing the spores that will infect the, the ABs. So what can you do about it? Uh, Amistar has the EMU I mentioned earlier, that includes rusts for outdoor ornamentals. You can try Signum, Oscalid, Pyrechlosprobin as a protectant. However, as I said before, trying to get the coverage of the trees is, is pretty difficult, and um, particularly at that um, paintbrush stage when they're really tight together. And again, you're looking to spray before you know it's going to be raining, before you get this really uh, burst of spore release often happens in May, but again, you don't know it's going to happen. So again, we've got the issue of we need to develop some forecasting systems. So cultural control, this, I think this really is where you need to concentrate. So break the rust life cycle by ensuring the fireweed is absent. Janet was talking about checking fields that you're going to, you're going to be planting in, um, because otherwise you can get the tealia overwintering on the old leaves. Um, like the other pathogens, rust needs free water to infect. So if you can dry the uh, needles out by various methods, by opening up the canopy, um, removing weeds, then, then do so. Um, tests in Denmark indicate that difference in, is in flushing date or to disease severity. So if you have particular varieties that you know are going to flush later, then they might be worth considering. But then again, you don't know if when the rainstorms are going to happen, so you may get a later rainstorm. So it's not a, it's not a total solution. Um, but selective breeding for late flushing in Nordmans may uh, help against the rust, um, and those breeding is done to avoid spring frosts. So there, there may be something you can look at there. Okay, that's the end of the rust. And I've uh, prepared a, a summary table. If we just uh, spend a few minutes going through that. So we last talked about the rusts. So as I said, this is the infection period, the eyes and the infection period, the S is the symptoms. So the infection period in May, June, from those um, overwintering spores on the fireweed, uh, rain, rain events that cause the spores to disperse and then the basidia uh, can infect pretty quickly. You will get symptoms showing pretty, pretty uh, straight away after. You'll get the needles getting worse and worse um, and they will re release the spores that you'll see on the underside and then they will infect the fireweed. So really all over and done with probably by September the needles will have dropped and the damage is done. Uh, with current season needle necrosis, um, we've got that infection period on the young tissue, that new growth. Usually around that May, June period is shown there uh, because the young needles are susceptible, but then the symptoms can show sight quite quickly, particularly if the plant's been stressed for the heat, um, but they may well just start to show any time to up to Christmas or beyond, just beyond Christmas, uh, and with then the needle drop um, happening as well. The rhizosphera, probably the peak of, in, of infection will be in the May, June period when you get those thunderstorms, but it can continue on to, to the end of August, possibly into September, but you won't get the symptoms showing. You might get slight, slight discoloration happening in the end of the first year, but the majority of the symptoms will show into the second year when you'll get the uh, purpling of the needles, the needles dropping, a few symptoms perhaps starting to still be uh, shown later into the following year, but the, the peak of the problem will be in that centre period in the, the second year. Okay, that's, that's me. Thank you. Many thanks, Erica and um, Janet. Is there any questions from anybody?
Janet, did you want to pick up on a few bits? I saw you put a few bits in the chat. Oh uh, yeah, I now I can't remember totally what they were basically questions to Erica actually. Um, I would, one thing I was going to point out, um, and, and just to make sure that you know participants really realise this, take this on board. Uh, so far, um, the American willow herb has not, and I stress has not, been identified as the alternate host of um, fireweed rust on Christmas trees. It is specifically the deep-rooted perennial uh, that Erica has mentioned, you know, fireweed, rose bay willow herb, that is the cause of the trouble. I think another question that I, or, or thing that I raised was to say to people that it's very important that if they are considering planting northern fir, that not only do they check the field itself for presence of rose bay willow herb, and then make the decision, you know, how much of it is there, is it possible to control it, but please, please look in the hedgerows and any adjacent woods, because this is an edge of woodland or woodland glade plant. And I have known people uh, not sort of look to see what's going on in their surroundings. Um, and then a couple of years down the line, suddenly get really serious uh, rust infection and, and uh, needle loss as a result of the disease, because they've had a big storm and the spores have you know, spread into quite far into the field away, you know, from uh, willow herb, which is effectively growing outside, you know, the actual plantation itself. You'd be surprised how far it uh, can spread. Uh, it's quite a spectacular disease. When you see it for the first time, you will know you have um, uh, fireweed rust. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise, actually, uh, asked a sort of question, actually, this is to Erica. Um, when I've been looking, at plantations which have been found to be affected by Rhizosphera calcophii, quite often I have noted, but so far not checked, I, I um, uh, you know, um, apologize for that bit, um, that there's forestry plantations of things like Norway spruce that were planted for timber in adjacent land, which seem to have big areas of their worlds, branch worlds, particularly the lower and middle region, uh, with needle browning and loss very similar to Rhizosphera. I mean, could this be a major source of infection, you know, of new plant plantings, uh, particularly sort of in mountainous areas where, you know, coniferous plantings are likely to be a possibility, you know, that Christmas tree growers ought to look out for and perhaps avoid sites where they've got adjacent forestry, or if it's theirs, eliminate, I cut down some of the infected trees. Yes, it's possible, isn't it? Um, there's, I have got a list of the different types of uh, pines and firs, uh, certainly mm. in the States. So there's quite a long list of, of things that can be infected by rhizosphere. Of course, as you know, there are other diseases as well. So, but you don't, you know, if you don't have to plant near those plantations, then mm. uh, try not to. But whether you need to sort of chop down the whole hillside, I think is going to be a problem. Yeah, no, I was thinking particularly, uh, you know, close, fairly close to, you know, within sort of what 30 or 40 metres or 50 metres, say, something like that. And particularly if they are on the downwind side. So if you have a storm and you've got, say, a southwesterly wind blowing, that it's more likely that spores will go into, into a plantation, you know, rather than plantings per se, you know, which are sort of well away, if you see what I mean, from the from the Christmas trees. Yes, I think we've learned with the um, Phytophthora morum with larch, oh. how much of a problem, how far things can spread from trees onto onto other yeah. onto plants. Um, yes. So yes, I mean, particularly, oh no, there, there was queries about things like birds uh, spreading mm. diseases. So there's always there's always that problem with uh, these sort of slime slimy diseases. Then they don't blow. They don't sort of unless you've got a a misty wind, the thing, mm. um, which you can, I know, get in Cornwall, um, then they're not going to sort of blow. But um, yes, there is a certain, certainly in close proximity, the, the greater the chance of it spreading. Mm. Mm. Can, can I, another thing, one last one, actually, I think about it, um, just to give, you know, attendees an idea of the classic weather, in my opinion, for um, getting current season needle necrosis to spread or should I say to sort of manifest its uh, existence and uh, we, we actually almost had this last uh, summer 
um, it would be, I think, the first week of June, and it was about, I think it was the 6th or 7th, certainly down here, and I know in other parts of the country, we had a couple of immense thunderstorms, uh, which, you know, the thunderstorms were occurring when the temperatures were 25 plus. As soon as they'd gone, the wind dropped away, and it was very still, and although it was very hot, it was actually the relative humidity was very high. So we had very high UV light levels, but very long, persistent period of uh, relative humidity, high relative humidity in the plantations. And in some sites where there was very poor, not very good air drainage, it was very noticeable that the disease developed within 48 hours. I mean, it was that quick. You know, typical current season needle necrosis. Mm -hmm. So th th there does seem to be a link up with these high, no doubt with these high, uh, light levels, but also the fact that the needles um, don't dry very quickly. And just following on from that, from my observation, I am always worried about what I call with Nordman fir, the flat needled tree. You know, some of the trees, they, they have a very noticeably uh, fairly broad flat needle profile, and there's a lot of needles so that, you know, they're very bushy trees, very dense trees. Those seem to be the more vulnerable to infection, presumably because I don't know, but, but they're either trapping the spores more readily or they're, you know, they're keeping it, the, it moister, a nicer environment for them to, um, to germinate, so to speak, and to grow. And what I call the bottle brush tree. Now, you've all probably seen the bottle brush tree, which remember show, I showed those pictures of the um, adelgias, you know, the crawlers out on the young shoots causing the spiraling. Well, it's not as extreme as that. But you know, sometimes you have trees where the needles seem to be slightly rolled in on themselves and very wiry and tough and covered very thoroughly with, uh, you know, a silicon epidermis and the water sheds off them very readily. Now, it is unusual, certainly as, as far as I'm concerned, to see current season needle necrosis on those trees. They seem to stand up to uh, the infection conditions much, much better. OK, I will stop rambling now. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Um, Michael, we, um, you were showing your picture. Um, did you want to ask any questions? Right. Am I going to see the picture? What do I have to do? It should be coming up on your screen, Janet. Oh, is this one? Oh, right, it's this one. Right, I'm with you. Yeah. Why is it oh, my goodness, right. This is, this is like Sandyland, yes? Is this Sandyland, Michael? Not not unduly, no. It's a, it's a useful loam, free draining. What, what, we planted fifteen hundred. Right. What what is the we grass that we planted? Grow? Well, that that's a good question. I haven't got down on my knees yet to identify right. it. Right. Well, it, uh, it would all past you. Ah, right. So it's probably fescues and things like that. It looks like it. A bit further to the left. I can see something which is flatter on the ground. Is that bindweed? No, the only weed there is grass weed at the moment. Right, okay. Right, well, you're a lucky, you're a lucky man then because it's actually quite easy to control or at least suppress. Um, I would be getting a little bit worried, particularly on the corners here, because you've got a lot of grass coming in. And although you could clear it up with a roundup, you know, at the end of the growing season, um, if this is all Nordmans, then you could probably apply that in what I suppose late August, early September at the earliest. But I think in the meantime, you could either use laser on it. That's got an EAMU for use in ornamentals. Um, I think the rate uh, is something like 2.25 meters, but I can, I can make sure you have the, uh, that, that information. Or the other product which works extremely well is one called Centurion Max. Um, and as a fruit grower, you might recognize an old name for it called clout, uh, which was with us a few years ago. And that's very good at, um, you know, a wide range of grasses, including some of the um, ones that are resistant to uh, products like Fusilade. Um, and that could be applied now. And that would clean it up quite nicely, particularly as the grass is growing very actively, very quickly. Okay. We do have Centurion Max. Um, oh, yeah. I just wanted to hear from you that we could carry on and use it. Well, it, how can I describe it? It is a great area. Um, I, I think I have, 
I found a reference that you could use it on ornamentals. I think that was to do with sunflowers rather than woody perennials. I know it's safe on woody perennials because I know lots of people used it under the long term arrangements for extension for use. But of course, that's now gone. So from the point of view of crop safety, there's no problem at two litres per hectare. It works very, very well. OK. Thank you. Well, I, actually, I will just say one thing, actually, to to both of you, actually, the, uh, you know, attending. Fusilade, uh, you you can use, I think. No, you can't use on ornamentals. It, so that means Christmas trees as well. Um, also, the rate of use now is ridiculously low at one litre per hectare, which only takes seedling weeds. So forget about it. Um, and it's no longer usable on strawberries. It's It's been taken off the label. Many thanks, Janet. Uh, do you have any day. questions, David? Is there anything you'd like to ask? You're on mute, sorry. There you go. Um, yeah, looking at Michael's picture there, the um, are you recommending that he could go in now, even those those trees are sort of flushing by the look of that? Well, yeah, I, I'm fairly ha I'm fairly happy about using uh, Centurion Max on newly flushing, you know, on trees that are actively flushing. Uh, I take your point, um, and the same with laser. There, there is, you know, nothing that says you can't. And in my experience, people get away from it. Ironically, Fusilade used to be the one that was more likely to cause damage. But one thing I would say, if you're getting temperatures, you know, above say 20, 22, I would you know not spray until they come down i mean there's no urgency if you see what i mean you'll you'll get just as good results if you've got 30 degrees today which we have here then you will just get as good a results in leaving it for another you know three four days or even a week or a fortnight you will still get good results with uh, centurion max at la or laser but particularly yeah. the centurion max to be on the safe side oh good thank you and you thought that you could go in with glyphosate as early as september well, we, we do down here. It's really a case of when the needles and the, are in the right condition, and more importantly with Nordmans, particularly the leaders, you know, in the top world, that the buds are sealed down sufficiently. And if we have a hot, dry summer in this part of the world, you know, often they, they will be going out. And I stress with a low rate of glyphosate, so that may only be one or one and a half litres. Some people, at the end of August, I prefer personally to wait till September but a lot of people can't do that because they're in the run-up towards starting to lift or cut. Uh, you know, things start to happen very quickly and they, mm. they like these days to have a withdrawal period, um, you know, from using pesticides. And that includes insecticides as well before they start harvesting. You know, the, the end outlets, the supermarkets insist upon it. Oh. And we're going well, to see more, more of that, I'm afraid. Well, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you, Janet. Um, can I just take the um, opportunity to remind you that we have the study trip planned for the 3rd of August um, to Santa Fe Christmas Trees in Guildford. I have posted the link to the event bright in the chat. Um, numbers have been limited to 15 to make sure that we're fully compliant with COVID precautions. And because of this, can I ask that a maximum of two per business and that you keep us fully informed as to whether you're able to attend. Um, but please do let others know as well that of that event coming up. So thank you very much for attending all. And thank you, Janet and Erica, again for the webinar. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, David. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye, Michael. Bye. 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 <clears throat>